Tangerine Pulpa Vines, written and narrated by Clancy Pasta. Walk on over and take a rest. See the dancing submarines and the walking tulips. The ad in the local newspaper jumped out at me like a curly hair and a cup of tea. I took it with me as I sat down on my sofa instead of throwing it across the hall into the trash can. I brought it closer to my face to study the smeared and smudgy newspaper printing. Tangerine Pulpa Vines was the apparent name of the business being advertised scribbled out in childish, crayon-looking lettering. The ad was in black and white, but the way the ink looks like flaking drywall gave it away. There was a small picture of a funny little man with a goofy mustache, holding a cup of what I assumed to be tangerine juice, and covered in what looked like grapevines. At the top left, a local phone number was printed just below a website address. I pried open my laptop and punched the letters in. The page took a few seconds longer than most to load, and I was greeted with a website designed straight out of the 90s. Pixelated even on my HD monitor, or relatively close enough, the layout took the form of a long black rectangle framed by a background gif of cups of pink-orange liquid tipping over and spilling back and forth, and long, ever-expanding grapevines crawling their way south in an endless pattern. In that long black rectangle contained lines upon lines of white text, all small print, and it appeared to be in Times New Roman font, or something equally as generic. I grabbed my reading glasses from the cushion to my left and pulled the laptop screen closer to my face. I read the first line. Come on by today, located at the corner of Cherry and Bert. I immediately moved to the next line of text and raised an eyebrow at the sight of a copy of the exact same line. Come on by today, located at the corner of Cherry and Bert. Scrolling all the way to the bottom, my eyes scanned past dozens upon dozens of lines of the same phrase. At the very bottom of the page, there was somehow an even smaller line that said, Copyright 2004, Mr. Pulpavine. I sat the laptop down on the coffee table and slouched back into the sofa. What a strange website, I thought, and I wondered how strange the actual business must be with a site like that. I was familiar with Cherry Street and Bird Avenue, just about a five minute detour from my route to work. I decided I'd drive by on my way in in the morning and see what the building looked like. The ad caught my attention and the website took that attention and added a pound of confusion and curiosity. I turned off the laptop and slipped it into my computer bag, picking it up and setting it right by the door to bring to work with me in the morning. It was a habit I performed every night in an effort to cut back on the amount of running around in my apartment I'd do half asleep, barely taken out of my slumber by my blaring alarm. I slipped under the covers, took some melatonin, and was out like a light. Stepping into my car the next morning, slipping my computer bag off into the passenger seat to my right, the website was all I was thinking about, and the name of the place kept repeating itself in my mind. Tangerine Pulpa Vines. What a strange name. The tagline in the ad said something about dancing submarines and flowers or something, but I obviously had no idea what that meant. The only thing I could think of is that it was some kind of clown thing, but thought that if that were the case, it should have been a little more obvious. Driving down the road, I saw my turn for Cherry Street was coming up. I took the left onto Cherry and knew that Bert was just a few intersections down. The red lights seemed to linger on for much longer than they should have, but they all eventually switched to green. And as the third red light switched back to green and I rolled forward to the intersection of Cherry and Bert, the confusion I'd already felt at the strange ad and its website was shifted into overdrive. There were businesses around, 
Small strip mall type outlet buildings lining both sides of the street with little barber shops, restaurants, stuff like that. But at the one empty corner stood nothing. Just a barren lot. Not even weeds growing up out of the earth. Just dirt and rocks. Some old candy wrappers and styrofoam cups littered the ground. I rolled through the intersection slowly, scanning my surroundings and looking for anything I could have missed, but there wasn't even a building there, let alone anything called Tangerine Pulpa Vines. I must have remembered the address wrong or something. Once I had passed the intersection, I just shook my head and resolved to think about it when I got back home from work that night. I took the next left, got back onto my main road, and headed to the office. That night when I got back home, the first thing I did was flip my laptop open and press the power button. While it was warming up, I went to the kitchen and brewed myself a cup of Earl Grey tea. I always preferred peppermint with green, but I was out, so the good old Earl would have to do. Tea in hand, I sat back down onto the couch and loaded up the internet browser. I typed in the same website address I'd entered the night before, but when it loaded up, I immediately thought I must have screwed something up. The page loaded fully, but was just a completely pink screen. No text, no graphics or moving GIFs, nothing. I clicked refresh and then leaned over to the pile of papers I really should organize to try and fish out the newspaper with the ad in it. I found it and compared the address on the paper with what I had typed. I had typed it incorrectly, yet the page had loaded something entirely different. I was confused still, but also intrigued. I placed the newspaper back down and placed the laptop on my lap. I tried to scroll down, but it looked like the website had taken up the entirety of my screen. Just a blindingly hot pink. I think I made an audible hmm sound, even though I was completely alone. Now, I have a bad habit of not exiting out of tabs I'm done with, so over the course of the evening, by the time I was ready to lay down for bed, I had about a dozen or so pages still up. I exited out of Netflix, and YouTube, then about five different Wikipedia pages, a few others, and then found myself staring into that intense pink sheet. I moved my cursor onto the page and tried to see if I could scroll down at all again, but just like I expected, I couldn't. But as I moved back up to exit out of the page, my cursor briefly changed into a hand and then morphed back indicating I'd passed over a link or some other clickable object. I moved the cursor back over the general area and found a tiny little spot no bigger than a few pixels that seemed to be clickable. My gaze shot to the bottom left of the screen where hovered links would preview, but the link was just a garble of letters and numbers. Not even a .com or .net was visible. I was weirded out by this, and for good reason. I'd met my fair share of viruses in the past, and I didn't intend to screw up my only computer, which I used for both work and recreation. But then again, I doubt a business advertising itself in the local paper would have any kind of links to malware or viruses. It was most likely just a strange domain, or perhaps it was shortened with one of those URL shortening services. I wasn't sure at all about any of that, but my curiosity was burning. I couldn't just exit out of the page with this opportunity in front of me. For all I knew, by the time I loaded the page again, it could already be completely different. I took a deep breath and clicked the mouse without another thought. Immediately upon doing so, the bright pink of the page flipped to a bright blue along with a white colon parenthesis frowny face that took up almost the entirety of the screen. I stared for a moment, and then laughed. What a strange little website. I thought there might have been more hidden links here for me to investigate, 
but after swirling the cursor around the screen for five or so minutes with no luck, I decided to finally exit out and power it down for the night. I figured I could check it out one more time the next night and see if anything had changed. Little did I know how much things would change by then. I usually sleep straight through the night. The melatonin helps out quite a bit with that, I think. But at some point in the night, I woke up. I didn't have to use the restroom or anything, so I tried to just keep my eyes closed and drift back to sleep. But when I realized that wasn't going to work, I turned my head to glance at the old digital clock I've had since my school years on the nightstand. It was around 2 a.m. I usually go to bed around 11, so I had only been out for a few hours. I stared at the ceiling for a bit, the rotation of my fan above the only thing distracting my mind. I don't usually keep a glass of water by the bed, since I tend to sleep straight through the night, but my throat was starting to get uncomfortably dry, so I got up to make my way to the kitchen. But when I opened my bedroom door, what I saw made me question whether I was truly awake or not. Instead of my hallway extending before me, opening up into the dining room kitchen area, I was greeted with the deepest darkness I had ever experienced. I always have the bathroom light on, with a door cracked in the hallway, and the red glow from the clock on the microwave is never off. But I saw nothing. Literally nothing. I walked back over to my bedside table and grabbed my phone from the drawer. I flipped on the flashlight feature and walked back over to the door. I aimed it out into the hall, and it was like the darkness literally ate up the radiance like a black hole. I couldn't even get it to illuminate the walls when aimed point-blank directly towards them. It was like a thick fog made up of lead and charcoal dust had enveloped my apartment, not letting even an inch of light pass through. I lowered the phone to my side and walked backwards a few steps, sitting back down on the side of my bed. I sat there for a few moments, and then quickly pinched myself on the arm. I definitely felt it, that quick sting. But then again, I'm not sure how accurate that is in judging whether you're in a dream or not. I had read online that clocks don't tend to keep the same time in a dream, so I looked at my digital clock once again, noting the time of 2.11, turned my head away, closed my eyes tight, and then turned back. It was now 2.12. I don't think that would technically count as change indicative of a dream. When I looked back up towards the hall, I felt my heart leap into my throat. I could see down the hallway now illuminated by the dimmest pink glow coming from just outside of my view. Just to the right, at the end of the hall, inside my living room. I aimed the flashlight out of the door frame and could actually see now, though it looked nothing like how it should have. The white walls of the hallway were bright blue, and every picture I had hanging, about three on each side of family and a few art pieces, seemed to have been emptied, now only vacant frames slanted and uneven against the walls. I nervously looked around, paranoid that somehow someone was playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, though that thought melted away almost as quickly as it appeared. Feeling my heart in my eardrums, the feeling of thirst now in the back of my mind, I got up and walked through the door frame. I nervously scanned both sides of the walls with my flashlight as I slowly walked down the hall. The previously white pane of the wall had a blotchy texture to it, but as I leaned over and squinted to my left, the blue almost seemed to glisten, and I could swear that it appeared to be melting downwards very slowly. Too slow to tell if it actually was, or if my eyes were just playing tricks on me in the dim light. As I made my way past the end of the hall, the source of the pink glow became immediately apparent. It was coming from the screen of my laptop, which was now open on my coffee table in front of the sofa. I felt a jolt of adrenaline shoot through me as I recalled my nightly routine, 
shut the laptop down, slide it into the case, and place it by the door. The case was still sitting where I'd left it, but the computer had managed to make its way back to the table, open itself up, and power on. Not only that, but I could make out the faint impression of the window of an internet browser. I walked over to the sofa, carefully placing my steps as to not make a sound. I don't know why I was being so careful in that regard, but my nerves had me so on edge I wasn't thinking everything through, just acting on instinct, fear, and curiosity. I sat down on the seat and gazed into the screen. The internet browser was indeed up, and the screen was filled with a bright hot pink. In the center was a repeating gif of that funny looking little man from the newspaper ad. He was a bit more detailed now than in the paper. I could make out his male pattern baldness a bit more clearly, and I noticed his bushy mustache had lots of stray hairs poking out in odd random directions, though they were random in a way that upon further inspection, must have been purposefully posed to create such a wild look. The deep green vines with hints of pink and streaks of purple covered his body from his shoulders to his ankles, bright green leaves concealing his body further, and in his hand was a cup. The gift seemed to be made up of two images, one of him holding the cup upright and the second of it tilting to the side pink liquid flowing over the rim. My eyes descended to just under the gif, and I was shocked to see a small line of text. As I read it, I felt beads of cold sweat begin to dot my forehead. It read, Hello, Robert. I'm Mr. Pulpavine, and I want to make you the happiest man in all of Tangerineville. Robert. Reading my name, no, just reading a message obviously directed at me, despite not putting in any personal information, creating any accounts or anything like that, made me feel like I was going to be sick. And then I thought about the link I'd clicked. Oh, Jesus Christ, I whispered to myself. I knew I shouldn't have clicked that shady hidden link on the website the night before. But then I thought about everything else that had happened since waking up, and knew the explanation couldn't be as simple as a virus. I went back to looking at the man, when I noticed a slightly transparent word sandwiched between two brackets that read, Refresh. I raised my eyebrows at this. I moved my cursor to the text, but there was no hidden link or anything, and then my eyes darted the refresh button. I slowly moved the cursor up, and with a horde of butterflies swarming in my stomach and through my intestines, I pressed down with a click of my index finger. The page took a few seconds to load, but when it did, things had changed ever so slightly. The man, Mr. Pulpavine apparently, was still there Still the same two image pattern changing back and forth every few seconds or so, but the gif was larger on the screen. It hadn't doubled its size, but it was close, and the image was also much more detailed. His eyes, that before had simply been two little black dots, actually had their whites now. The man also gained some ears. The vines had gained a shocking amount of detail nearly looking like a piece of art created by a famed painter. It had gone from looking like a straight-up cartoon to something much more fancy and much more stylistically ambiguous. But that's not what kept my cold sweat going. When I saw what the line of text below the man now said, putting aside the fact that it had changed at all, I felt like the wind was knocked out of me. Jesus Christ isn't my name, it's Tangerine Pulpavine, and aren't you a bit thirsty, Robert?" I stared into the screen, at the text, my jaw agape, the room spinning. How was this possible? I was indeed thirsty, 
though I hadn't thought about it for a bit, that was the reason I got up in the first place, to get a glass of water. But how would this website know that? And how the hell had it heard me speak in the first place? I was creeped out beyond belief at this point. What had once been a strange little website for a business I couldn't decipher had morphed into a confusing nightmare. I wanted to just slam the laptop shut and be done with it, the thought entering my mind in a flash, and I lifted my hands to the edge of the screen. But then another thought entered my mind. What was I to do after I closed my laptop? What was going to happen with my now blue walls and the pictures missing from their frames? And how did the laptop even make its way to the table and open up in the first place? I felt that closing the laptop now would leave too many questions unanswered and possibly much worse. Not knowing what else to do, I spoke. Uh, I began, hesitating and pausing for a few moments. I am thirsty. Can you hear me? I said, still not fully believing what was happening. Not even a full second later, the halfway transparent text appeared above the man once again. I hit refresh. Mr. Pulpavine was bigger on the screen now, looking even less like a cartoon and more like a detailed painting than before. It wasn't lifelike, the proportions and features still very cartoony, but the actual way it was done was like the artist was trying to make it as lifelike as possible. It's like those photos online of what Beavis and Butthead would look like if they were real people, though I guess not quite as grotesquely realistic. I could see his irises now. They were a dirty, faded pink. I could see the whites of his eyes were bloodshot, and he had a bunch of freckles and liver spots staining the top of his scalp. The fingers wrapped around his cup of juice had long, unkempt fingernails, browned and yellowed, and chipping at the end. I could now even make out his lower lip, peeking out from beneath the mustache. And while I waited for another line of text to appear, a voice came from the speaker. I jumped in my seat, arms shaking at the shock, but composed myself quickly in focused effort. I'm not sure I caught the first couple of words, but what I heard was something along the lines of, The refrigerator. You'll find just what you need. The voice was slightly gruff, but kind of high-pitched as well. Nothing like the squeak of a mouse, but much more natural. The words fell out of my tinny laptop speakers, sounding as if they were recorded in an open, echoey hall. As I opened my mouth to speak, I could feel my bottom lip quiver and quickly shut it. Then, after a painfully dry gulp, I regained my nerve. What did you say? I asked. I still hadn't processed the partial sentence I'd heard. You're very thirsty, Robert, the voice spoke. Go to the refrigerator and you'll find exactly what you want. My eyes darted between the image of Mr. Pulpavine and the speakers on the keyboard base of my laptop, and then they shifted to the kitchen. And when they did, my stomach dropped once again. I could see blue light flickering in and out from behind the fridge door. For light to actually make it through the seams, it must have been very powerful. After a few moments of paralysis, I stood and began creeping my way towards the door. The handle was cold as my touch met the metal. I preemptively squinted in preparation for what I assumed to be the blinding light but the moment it cracked open, the light immediately dimmed to that of a small candle, the light no longer bleeding through the seams. Slowly, I pulled it the rest of the way open to see what was inside. Now, I didn't always keep food stocked, but I knew I had some produce, a few bottles of cola, and some leftovers in there. 
But, and I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised by this point, everything that had been kept cold and fresh had now vanished. Barren shelves were all that greeted me, except for a quaint, medium-sized paper cup in the middle shelf. It was solid white, aside from a pink T printed to the left of a bright purple P. The text looked generic, like the cheapest, blandest font you could find. As I stared, I heard the voice call out from the speaker once again, this time seeming to raise its voice slightly, like it was trying to make sure I heard it from the kitchen. Just one sip, Robert, the thing called out. Just one sip and you'll never turn back. As I stared at the cup, letting the words sink and settle into my brain, I thought I heard a much quieter, much more muffled voice say, You'll never want to. What? I called out through my burning throat, turning my head quickly towards the laptop. Silence filled the air. A few moments later, I turned back towards the fridge. My mouth felt like sandpaper against my tongue now, and it was getting more intense by the minute. The thought occurred to me to grab a cup of water, but then I thought about everything that had happened thus far. The kitchen sink to my left, I leaned over and turned the faucet knob. Nothing flowed from the tap but air, just as I had suspected. I sighed and looked back to the fridge. The longer time passed, the more I began to convince myself that this must indeed be a dream, or some kind of intense, gripping, pre-dream hypnagogic hallucination. Nothing made sense, but the one thing I knew for sure was that if I didn't coat my throat in some kind of drink soon, blood might take its place. The dryness was that bad. If it was a dream, if this was all taking place in an alternate reality of my mind's creation, surely it wouldn't hurt to indulge? What harm could possibly occur from taking a drink from this hallucinated beverage? When I know I'll be able to grab a cup of water in the waking world when my body allows me to join it once again. It could make me feel better, at least. The mind is a powerful thing. In dreams, you can feel, see, hear, and taste things that were never sensed via outside stimuli. You can experience anything and everything. And I think this falls somewhere within that spectrum. I leaned forward, and my fingers wrapped around the chilled cup. Pulling it out, I saw the liquid was a bright neon pink, seeming to glow in the shadow darkness. I raised it to my nose to get a hint of its aroma. It was greeted by what I took to be a pleasant mixture of oranges and chocolate. Was that what tangerine smelled like? I felt not, but this was a dream after all. Reality can afford to bend. But that close to my face, as I looked down into the liquid, I saw the barest hint of my reflection. I saw my groggy eyes, furrowed, concerned eyebrows, and a bushy, unkempt mustache. And just as I began to process this image, just as the bubble of thought began to rise to the surface, the thought that said, I don't have a mustache. My arm acted of its own accord and smashed the paper cup into my face, crunching it against my lips and nose, bright neon pink liquid squirting up my nostrils, and a gulp full of juice splashing into my mouth and down my throat. Though the juice tasted of citrus, it burned like acid against my throat and skin. I coughed and gagged, stumbling backwards. Losing my footing, I fell backwards and knocked the back of my head hard against the tile floor of the kitchen. My vision blurred and the burning acidity of the juice was joined by a sickening headache, increasing in intensity twofold every moment. My vision began to cloud over, and as the sensations in my body grew fuzzy, 
I caught a glimpse of myself in the reflection of a large piece of the glass chandelier above. It was me, definitely me, as I could make out my worried crunched eyebrows and furrowed forehead lines anywhere after years and years of self-conscious staring into the mirror. But my head of hair was now gone. Thin, short strands poking out on the sides, my eye slid down to the mustache I had caught earlier, and then to the upper half of my body, visible in the reflection. The t-shirt I could still feel against my skin was gone, replaced by a winding assortment of vines. In the moment before my vision finally collapsed, I stared myself in the eyes. They were bright pink. The world escaped me into the void. When I awoke the next morning, the sun beating up against the kitchen window's shades, I was on the floor. The headache was the first thing I noticed. I sat up, rubbing the back of my head, and noticed a large, bare lump. Emphasis on the word, bare. Immediately, my groggy eyes shot open. The events of the previous night flooded me, and I jumped to my feet, running towards the bathroom. As I did, I briefly noticed that the walls were no longer blue, and the photos no longer missing. Once in the bathroom, I flipped on the light. The sight shocked me. I wasn't sure exactly what I was expecting. I suppose one of two extremes. Either I was back to my normal self, or I feared I had transformed into the image I had seen in my reflection moments before blacking out. But what I saw dropped my jaw to the floor. My full head of hair was gone, appearing to have been buzzed. And so were my eyebrows. The mustache I didn't have in real life was still nowhere to be seen, but so was my shirt, though there were no vines to replace them. I was still in my boxer shorts. My eyes were bloodshot, looking like I hadn't slept in days, and quite frankly, I felt like it. I stumbled out of the bathroom, down the hall, and collapsed onto my sofa. I closed my eyes, and without a single thought drifting through my mind, I began to cry. Tears flowed from my eyes, and my breathing convulsed and contracted in loud bawling moans. I was so confused. I don't even think my brain could process what had happened, what was real, what was an illusion, and what the hell was really happening to me or reality itself. As my labor breathing calmed, I opened my eyes, wiping away the remaining tears. And before me, I saw my laptop on the coffee table, right where it was the night before. The screen was on, the internet browser open, but the page was pure black. Quickly, my eyes darted to the kitchen. Though that was where I awoke, I saw no liquid spilled on the floor, no crunched up paper cup from tangerine pulpa vines, nothing except what appeared to be a small smudge of blood where my head hit the tile. I turned my head back to the screen, the completely blank, black screen. I leaned forward to move the cursor around and discovered, just like I had the previous evening, a hidden link, invisible but clickable, in the middle of the page. The clickable area was a bit larger than before, and the preview link visible in the lower left-hand side read, https colon slash slash website url dot com slash what comes next. I read it over and over again. I almost clicked it out of instinctual curiosity, as well as simply not knowing what else to even do, but then I stopped. Before I clicked that link the night before, 
The only thing I knew Tangerine Pulp Vines from was that silly ad. It didn't seek me out, at least I don't believe so. I saw it out. I went to the website. I drove by the address. I visited the website again, clicked the hidden link, and planned on doing it again. Whatever this was, I couldn't help but feel I'd brought it upon myself. But then again, what else was there to do? What else could this thing possibly do to me? That may be a stupid question, as I know my mind could flood with a million different paranoid possibilities if I allowed it. But how can I judge what's realistic and what isn't? Is it possible? I suppose that would require me to understand what it was that even happened last night in the first place. And I don't. And I don't believe I can. I don't believe it's even possible. I weighed the options in my mind, mouse hovering over the link, finger on the trackpad. I thought about the alternate reality I woke up to in the night. I thought about that strange version of Tangerine Pulpavine that appeared on my screen, changing more and more in vivid detail with every refresh of the page. How it spoke to me, directly to me, knowing my name and even knowing when I was in the kitchen. I thought about that strange neon pink liquid and how my arm seemed to act of its own accord, thrusting it into my face and down my throat. I thought about my transformation in the reflections, and my true transformation I discovered upon waking. And as I thought about all of that, my finger twitched, and I accidentally clicked the trackpad. A new page loaded, bright neon pink with a small white word in the middle of the screen. It said, Enjoy. That's it. That's the only word on the page. I moved the mouse around searching for any other hidden links, but couldn't find a single one. After a while of searching and finding nothing, I decided to refresh the page. Upon the click of the mouse, the page 404 and when I tried to type in the original website address, the homepage of Tangerine Pulpavines did the same. I didn't leave my home for a few days after that. I was too much of a wreck to. I wondered what my boss or co-workers would think if they saw my strange transformation my hair messily buzzed off in a look not quite fitting to my personal style. My bloodshot eyes also made me fear the assumptions they'd make. Luckily, I had a couple of days off anyway, and I shot an email to my supervisor letting him know I wasn't feeling well and wouldn't be in the day after, either. I mostly laid in bed, watching the ceiling fan spin, hearing the air conditioner turn on and off, listening to the house settle, occasionally darting my gaze out into the hallway in a jolt of adrenaline just to make sure it was still there and still as it should be. It always was. I had horrible nightmares those few nights, though I can't remember what they were. When I would wake up after less than an hour's rest, heart racing and adrenaline pumping, all I could remember were the memories from that night, and then I'd fall back down into the bed, letting the memories haze away as far back as they would allow. By day four, I knew I had to go back to work. I couldn't afford to stay home and do nothing any longer. I slipped on a decent outfit, not quite as professional as I'd usually like, but decent enough to pass and a beanie hat to cover my new hairstyle. I slipped the laptop which I had run numerous virus scans on in the time between that morning and then, all coming out clean, back into my laptop bag and swung it over my shoulder. I turned back and gave the apartment one more look over, and it looks relatively normal. No glowing neon lights, 
no strange blue walls. The microwave clock was back. The refrigerator had gifted me some food since disappearing that night, and I realized that perhaps everything was going to go back to normal. Perhaps everything would just fade away into the past, and life would go on. Life would continue. I unbolted the lock to my front door, and as it creaked open, I was greeted not to the hallway of my apartment, but to the inside of a refrigerator. On the middle shelf was a paper cup, the contents of which I knew before ever picking it up. Right below the familiar colored lettering read a single word, Enjoy. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's original story. This is uh, this is only the second original story I've put out in, uh, in quite a while, so I, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I'd love to hear what you thought of it. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ClancyPasta. If you'd like to support the channel, I would really appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash ClancyPasta, or check out the merch store in the description below. Alright, I am tired, so I am going to head out of here, but once again, seriously, thank you all for listening, I really hope you enjoyed, and uh, have a great night. Cheers.